Hey, it's Illuminostic, and in this video, I'm going to talk about my experiences smoking pure N-N-dimethyltryptamine or DMT during an ayahuasca ceremony. This is definitely not something I would recommend doing unless you have a lot of experience in the psychedelic state and are very comfortable in this space. This is sort of the equivalent of a psychedelic jackass stunt, and this video is definitely for entertainment purposes only. So hit the like button, share, subscribe, please do support us on Patreon. So I was once told a story about an ayahuasca ceremony where the shaman was allowing people as much access as they wanted to the secretions of the bufo toad, which contains 5-MeO and 5-HO-DMT, or bufotenin. Bufotenin is a bit more toxic than in an DMT, <clears throat> but it still seems unlikely to me that you could consume enough of it to cause an overdose. However, I did consider that if this theory of Rick Strassman's that DMT is released when you're born and when you die is correct, perhaps if you reach a certain level, an extremely high concentration in the blood of DMT, that the body could be sort of fooled into believing that it was dying and just kind of release the soul. So there's at least anecdotal evidence that this could be a very dangerous practice that I've engaged in. The other day, I had an ayahuasca ceremony and I've had a little bit of trouble breaking through with DMT. It's probably honestly been 10 years or so. And I've actually noticed quite a bit of fear. And that was part of my motivation for attempting this. I did, definitely didn't do it for kicks. I wanted to pierce the veil. And also I have heard that uh, you can take much longer in that space, that it kind of makes it more manageable. The, uh, the body load from DMT becomes uh, smoother. The other reason that I was compelled to try this is that I have suffered from chronic fatigue syndrome for a very, very long time. And I once smoked DMT and all of the symptoms went away instantly. And recently, a few months ago, I read a study and they had determined that because DMT works on the Sigma-1 receptor, which regulates your immune system and energy production, that this DMT is probably the perfect compound to treat CFS and recently I hadn't been feeling as well and in case this was a recurrence of the, of the CFS I decided to try a very high dose of DMT in conjunction with ayahuasca to see if it would help to relieve the symptoms and felt a lot better since the ceremony. It does seem to have a pretty dramatic effect. I've been extremely productive. Um, I've also been microdosing mushrooms which I haven't done in a few years and I think that probably contributed as well but there was like a massive surge forward in terms of like my general health after the ceremony with the DMT and the ayahuasca. And also you can spend a longer time in that space and I've always felt like you know you get in there and you're out before you can really figure out what's going on or what to make of anything. It all just happens too fast. So I had a number of reasons for wanting to attempt this. Um, and the story actually begins several hours before the ceremony in terms of the experience of unity consciousness. Um, and I know people use that, maybe that term, maybe in different ways than I do. Um, and when I say it, I'm talking about the experience of synchronicity and also the experience of being part of the collective consciousness or the overmind or however you want to think of it. So as I was going to the ceremony, I needed to stop by and see a friend. And as I was walking through town, there are vendors that set up tables, usually indigenous, uh, Sadaguru or a couple of Shuar guys, and they have jewelry and drums and different, you know, ceremonial amenities. And this guy had some really nice cut up pieces of ayahuasca. And I thought, oh, I should buy one of those. And I'd never really had that impulse before because I have ayahuasca at home. I, I don't really need to buy a lacquered piece of ayahuasca. But I thought, well, you know, I really do want an ornamental one. And so I went to the guy's house that I needed to meet. And he, uh, he gives me this, which, you know, is a piece of ayahuasca with feathers from some birds that he had, that he had taken care of. So, well, that was kind of interesting. And so I go to the ceremony and this shaman, I have talked about experiences with him in other videos. He's extremely telepathic. And in, in, in a sense, I don't really like to give him credit for that because the vine has long been known to induce telepathy in people. There were clinical, there was clinical research done in the sixties, uh, by masters in Houston, PhD. They wrote a book called the varieties of psychedelic experience where they talked about this. They, they got overwhelmingly, proof positive results basically 
from these experiments. And also with this shaman, I've experienced it many, many. I think that he's been in that space so many times, these filters in our consciousness that bring down that barrier between our thoughts and other people's thoughts is sort of just permanently removed after a while. And I think there is some uh, neurobiological evidence for this because ayahuasca is known to actually physically ch change the shape of the brain in people that have used a lot of it. And this person has had a ceremony three to five nights a week for eight years. And then once a year, he drinks for 30 days straight, about a liter a day with the schwar in the jungle. So uh, you could do the math on that. That's an awful lot of ayahuasca. And for the record, he's not deranged or, you know, insane. As a lot of people would think from consuming that much ayahuasca, he's, he's one of the most balanced, insane people that I've ever met. And the shaman has a long history of telepathy with me. On many occasions, he has come over to where I'm laying or sitting and known what was going through my head and addressed it very directly. Uh, one such occasion, I was thinking about how when I saw my girlfriend, who has actually just had my baby, the first thought that went through my head, which came in the voice of Pachamama, was she will have, have your babies. Uh, I was sitting on the bus on the way to the jungle with this shaman, and I was thinking about this, and he looks over at me and he says, When I first met my partner, the first thought that went through my head was she will have my babies. Another time, I was sitting on the porch once we got to the house in the jungle, and I was trying to think of what to do. And I thought, well, I should ask her to tea because, you know, it's kind of casual and um, not very threatening. And I opened my eyes and the shaman is sitting there and he says, uh, you should ask her to tea, but by the river. Another time I could see through my forehead. I was laying on the deck and a mosquito bit me and I realized I was looking at it while it happened. Everything was kind of orange, I think, because I was seeing through the blood vessels and the skull. And so I started trying to test this. I was looking up and down the railing and it all looked exactly the way it did with my eyes open and I was waving my hands in front of my face trying to figure out if this was real or not. And so the next morning when I go downstairs, the first thing the shaman says to me is, you know, you can see through your forehead sometimes when you drink the medicine. And so I could go on and on. I mean, this happens over and over again, including just the other day, you know, as I said in the beginning of the video. And so that was when I really realized that this thing of, you know, telepamine, which is what the the early researchers called the harmala alkaloids in the vine uh, is, a, is an actual reality. It brings down the, the filters that cause us to experience our singular consciousness, which is of course illusory. You know, it's one soul divided for the sake of union. So we really truly are one mind. This is probably the most important element of the ayahuasca experience. And other entheogens like psilocybin um, have a reputation for causing these kind of experiences as well. But this experience of unity consciousness, rather than this abstract idea that we might adopt or it resonates with us, we're actually able to experience it in ways that absolutely cannot be denied. So we get there, the ceremony, the circle, everyone sits and it's customary for, you know, the shaman to introduce. I think we had some people that had, it was their first experience with ayahuasca. So he was kind of debriefing them and he would go around in the circle and I've known him for a long time and he knows all the things that have been happening in my life. He knows that my child was born recently, not breathing and that, you know, it was a very difficult birth for my partner as well. And so he was addressing that and saying, you know, I was praying for Luminostic and his child. My mind wandered and I started thinking about my trust issues. And as soon as that happened, the shaman says, and hopefully he will find more trust and he put a lot of emphasis on the word trust and I kind of you know my mind stopped wandering and suddenly I'm paying attention and uh, he also said that you know sometimes some for some I don't remember why he mentioned this but he said sometimes you can hear this sound that you can't normally hear when you drink the medicine and that night for the first time it was like a predominant part of the experience was this like loud sort of ringing sound in my head we drink the medicine and it's, you know, moderately strong. It was not overwhelming. And uh, one of the most interesting things that happened during the night, you know, I'm always kind of on the fence as to like whether these spirits that we see and these entities that we encounter have any objective reality. And because of the fact that I've received so much accurate information from them and also just the pure strangeness and it's just so foreign to anything I can imagine my mind generating. And also it's, 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 it's like, it's different every time, but there's this aesthetic that is always there. And even a personality with these beings and entities that is very consistent 
with both DMT and ayahuasca in terms of the personality. And so the shaman had just gotten back from the jungle and he had learned some new songs and he was singing these songs and they were very powerful. I had once had an experience with him where, you know, part of my teaching, he was telling me, you know, you're becoming a shaman, but you must sing. And I really was self-conscious about singing in this way. I mean, I can sing with a rock band or whatever. I've been doing that for years and that's fine. But to sing these channeled interdimensional languages uh, with the shaman in front of a group, it, it, <laughs> it was very difficult for me. But when I did it, a very extraordinary thing happened. My throat was opening and, and other parts of my body, the muscles were moving in ways that I would not have imagined possible. And it's like the medicine was doing this for me. And I'm listening to him sing and I can hear those movements and I actually realized that I knew what they were, which was cool. And then I had become aware of these like weird sort of lanky, uh, almost like claymation beings. They were like stretched out, I guess is a good way to explain it. And and I, at first they were just like shapes in my peripheral. I, I had my eyes closed, but I could see them and I wasn't really aware of what they were. And then suddenly I kind of glanced over and realized, oh, there's like a group of these little people sitting there watching the, the, the shaman. And every now and then when he would make a particularly interesting sound, they would nudge each other and like look at each other like, wow, did you hear that? And so I'm watching this go on for a while and that was really interesting. And then when they vanished and the shaman stopped singing, uh, something kind of disturbing happened. It was like this, this guy, I thought of him, of him as my dead pedophile uncle, although I had never had, to my knowledge, a dead pedophile uncle, but he was just kind of gross. He had like pale gray skin and sunken black eyes and uh, he kept trying to like nuzzle up to me, kind of like a cat would, you know, and I was like, oh God, get away, you're gross, you know? So eventually that thing went away and I'm looking at this like gorgeous multicolored, sort of like a giant Clydesdale horse, but just way stockier and more powerful. And there was sort of like a cosmic wind that would blow and it was made, this horse, of billions of colors and they would blow away little bits of it. But, you know, somehow it was always still there, even though it was kind of trailing off into the ether, these pieces. And after watching this for a while, the medicine, you know, it comes in waves a lot of times. And this was, it had started to recede and I was getting kind of bored. And I thought, oh man, I wish something would happen other than that sound. And as soon as I think that, there's the shaman again, right beside me and he says, are you listening? And I'm like, yeah, I'm listening. And he said, good. And he pulls out these like giant tuning forks and he hits them and then sticks it on my forehead. And there's this sound like through my entire body ringing and harmonizing my being. And then he hits it again and puts it on my heart chakra and, and you know, down throughout the rest of the chakras. And then he sings this song in a, a mixture. When he sings, it's usually a mixture of schwar, Czech, English, Spanish, and then these syllables. The Swar creation story is that in the beginning, these spirits made these sounds that created the universe, which is really interesting because in Hebrew cosmology, the creation story, uh, the, the universe is made of the 22 letters of the Hebrew language. And it's sort of the same idea that this vibration, the word rushed forth and created the universe. And so there are these syllables that these interdimensional beings that we're channeling when we drink ayahuasca that their language is, is, is made of that are supposed to be the sounds that caused creation in the very beginning. So he's singing in a mixture of all of these languages and he's waving the, the leaf shakers and they're slapping me in the face and kind of stinging. And then he disappears. And I realized that uh, it would be a good time to go and smoke the DMT. And so I walk up on the hill away from the group because I don't really know what's gonna happen. And I have like a water pipe and I sit down and gather myself and I take the first hit of the DMT. And suddenly in front of my face, there's this tunnel and it's very vaginal. It looks like it's made of flesh and it's kind of shaking and vibrating. And there's this light, like this gray light at the end of the tunnel. And it's really, really cold. It's emanating this freezing, freezing air at me. And the water pipe in my hand is suddenly freezing cold as well. And I'm looking down this tunnel and I'm thinking, if I take another hit, I'm that what the light at the end of that vagina tunnel is my next life. So I'm gonna die, which is fine, but I'll, I'll, I'll come out of that hole and I'll be in my next life. That's what's happening right now. And then, you know, the more rational part of my brain said, 
No, this is probably just vasoconstriction and you should probably just get your courage together and take another hit. So I did. It probably took me five or 10 minutes and um, I got a much bigger one, held it much longer and I blew it out and I watched this bush like roll up into like a cone shape and everything in my field of vision was suddenly distorted. And it was, everything kind of looked like I had suddenly stepped onto the set of a Tim Burton film. There's this tremendous presence of something very powerful, ancient, and highly intelligent that I suddenly became acutely aware of. And this always happens with strong doses of DMT or ayahuasca. It's difficult to explain how you can feel or sense that something is ancient, but I always get the feeling whenever this energy is present that I'm dealing with something ancient beyond conception. And I vomited. Uh, almost immediately. I blew the smoke out and it's almost like the vomit was part of the smoke. And then I was really cold. I mean, ice cold. And I needed to take a third hit, but suddenly this yellow vision unfolds in front of me and it is bright, saturated. I mean, it's difficult to describe these things, especially to someone who has never seen them, but it was bright, bright yellow. And there were these little beings kind of in square pattern uh, maybe holding the fabric of this vision together and they kind of looked like little like samurai action figures except that you know what DMT would manifest them as you know with the aesthetic of a DMT hallucination that's really the the best I can do they were motionless they were just sitting there kind of holding this yellow and so this is where the unity consciousness kind of comes back into the story. About two years prior to this, I had been with this shaman and he had a co-facilitator, another shaman that was working with him. And uh, at one point I was overwhelmed with this vision that was a little bit more orange, but the same type of figures were there. It was a very, very, very similar vision. And this other shaman played this harmonica song that was just the most astounding, it, it, it just embodied the experience of ayahuasca in a way that just defied belief. I mean, it was truly an amazing thing to behold. And this shaman that I was with on the current occasion where I'd smoked this DMT, I'd never heard him play harmonica and I'd been in ceremony with him, I think 15 times over two years. And as soon as this yellow vision formulates, I hear that same harmonica song. I mean, it wasn't identical, but it was the same rhythm and the same I mean, it was like this guy's slight variation on the other song. So I'm looking at the same vision, listening to the same instrument, play the same music, and I couldn't take the third hit. That, that second hit took all of the strength out of me. I was almost, I was hanging over. I could barely keep my head up. Uh, it, it was just a bit too much. And so as the vision starts to fade, the harmonica slowly like decrescendo, retardando, and then as the colors poof and disappear, the harmonica song is perfectly over. And uh, so in reference to the experience of smoking DMT with the ayahuasca, I'm going to try it again, only I have a friend who has, who has more experience with this than I do. And uh, he says that you can very slowly ramp up. And so I'm going to attempt that and try to go full on mega breakthrough with the ayahuasca and I'll make another video about that. Okay, so there's a little bit more to this story. As I was leaving the next morning, the shaman says to me, pick one of these yellow roses. And so I pick this rose and he says, give it to your wife when you get home. And so I get home and my father-in-law is burying one of my, one of my partner's kittens. And so it, it was almost as if the shaman anticipated this and gave me this rose as a gesture of consolation for my girlfriend. So thanks a lot for watching. Again, I, I, will, I will do this experiment one more time and the title of that one will probably you know, reference a breakthrough so you'll be able to tell which, which one it is because I, I'm determined to follow this experiment through. So keep your eyes out for the DMT ayahuasca reboot video. Next up, the Psychedelics Masterclass is in editing, so it'll definitely be done in the next couple of days. Uh, hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon. Thank you so much for watching.